Uh, welcome to Beyond the Fundamentals. This is Kevin. I'm here with Nick, and we're going to talk about, I think we're talking about the four kinds of knowing and propositional knowing and some thoughts that we've had that uh, we thought would make an interesting conversation. So here we are. Welcome aboard, Nick. Glad to have you back. Thank you, Kevin. It's a pleasure to be back and see if we can muster up something of useful value. So what I'm kind of hoping to do, and just to show everybody else, we're going to have some visual aids up here in a second. We'll work, write down some of the things we're talking about. But, you know, as we think about the four kinds of knowing and try to bring these in basically as a set of questions to where maybe we can get a deeper understanding about Scripture, it's one of those things that, you know, the longer you think about it, the more insights open up about how it can be applied. Yeah. You know, it takes time. It takes time. Like, um, you can't just be exposed to an idea and all, this, all of a sudden be fluent in it. You, you kind of have to mull it over for a while and you have to bat it back and forth. And when we talked about these things in the past, you, you have insights, you, you kind of have affordances that open up my understanding. So I want to bounce some ideas off you, um, see if we can develop something, see if I'm on the wrong or right track here with some thoughts. <laughs> and I'm thinking about, and by the way, um, for anybody listening, there are some slides here. If you feel like your slides pertain to what I'm talking about, just tell me which one to go to. We can bring them up and go to that. Okay. So I had a thought occur to me. And, well, yeah, I'll just go ahead and write it up here. And this, I'm writing this up here just to kind of make it easier to follow. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. A custodial relationship with the information ecology right is one of the thoughts that I'm having and what what brought that up is to have a custodial relationship with the ecology first of all like if you think you don't want places to be polluted you do you don't want to you know you don't want to dump toxic waste into the river or anything like that so you have a custodial relationship with the ecology with the environment and you don't want to pollute things but the information ecology is the same way. In a sense, you have, the, just like we have to live in nature, and you can't get away from the fact that, you know, one minute nature may be sending a lion to eat you, and the next minute it's giving you a tree for shade and something you can cut down and build a house out of. I mean, nature, it's, uh, it, it's what you have to live in. And you can have a good relationship with it, or you can have a toxic relationship with it. And so the same thing comes the words. We, because we're humans, we we exist, we coexist socially with language, and that's one of the things that separates us from the animal kingdom is our ability to use propositional language to talk to each other and communicate information that way. But the the pointers, the indexical markers, propositional statements are really indexical markers that point at a deeper truth. Like when I say a cat is a mammal, it doesn't really mean anything unless you already know what a mammal is, which is a long list of characteristics and features. It's not just a thing. So you have to, you have to have a good amount of participatory perspectival information about what a cat is for the label of that animal to mean anything to you. Now, if I, if I cheapen the language and I start referring to other labels or start using, like say I use the same label for a cat and a dog, right. now, the, now the label means even less. Sorry, right, sure right. Hold on, Siri thinks that she knows something about that. All right. Wow. <laughs> Her Alexa. Oh, wow. <laughs> She's going to wake back up. You don't know which one it said. is, Siri or Alexa? Well, no, it's the Amazon Echo, but it sounds, her voice changed. She sounds like Siri now. She's trying, <laughs> to, she's trying to infiltrate, get a word in, make the, make the ecology toxic. That's exactly <laughs> right. I don't know. What do, you, what do you think so far? Okay, so when you sent me this, this the other night, it immediately drew me to, and to try and, 
tr try and you know ground this in scripture as, and draw it to scripture as much as we can for our own sakes and for the sake of people listening. Yeah. It reminded me of when Paul is going through in 1 Corinthians and he's addressing the Corinthians and he says, the first thing he says in chapter 4 is he says, um, uh, let a man so account of us as the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Mer yep. Moreover, it is required in a steward uh, that a man be found faithful. And so this is this is what it kind of reminded me of in terms of the call uh, to uh, sort of try and address, okay, what are my responsibilities with with my in my relationship to the information that I have about God? And yeah. and then trying to get a, a, a definition or at least a, a framework on what exactly the information what is information ecology and so the the first thing that i thought of trying to draw it draw it down to in biblical terms and yeah maybe i just want to present because i'm not i'm not convicted about this or anything but it's just what i thought of is like is it is it the kingdom of god hmm. is the is the information ecology the the ecosystem that we're in as in, like, uh, it just reminds me of, like, Jesus says to, when he talks to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, and he's like, uh, you must be born again and to enter into the kingdom of God, or he can't see the kingdom of God. I can't remember exactly what the phrase is. but Yeah, except is, to be born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God, right. except to maybe be born again. He cannot see the kingdom of God. Right. So I'm, I'm just trying to explore if that's a good framework to hand to people and say hey this is what when we're saying when we're using this term information ecology um well let's let's carry it a step further and say i mean this has the this proposition well it's not really i don't know if it's a proposition it's a thought really it's not a statement it's not declaring a truth i'm not proposing anything but anyway the point is that and maybe a question what is the relationship of the kingdom of god to the information ecology so how does the kingdom of God inform? So the kingdom, so the information ecology, oh yeah, inform. So inform, I guess, would, I'm thinking of proposition. I made the same trap that I'm trying to get out of is I'm thinking of propositional knowledge only. Mm. But the information ecology, so that, that brings up a good point. So kind of what I'm thinking of is um, information, if you think of, like we've talked about before, if you look at a chair, it's just, you think of its function. Like you sit in a chair mm -hmm. and you think it's a chair, but really it's just a bunch of pieces of wood put together. And it is only, it is only useful as a chair if those pieces of wood are cut a certain way and fastened together in formation. Right. And to serve in a certain capacity is when you have something that is in formation. We call that information. And it brings us together for a certain kind of function. So that can happen without propositional knowing. All right. So something's, something's connecting right here that I'm not, I can't see very clearly right now in yeah. the second slide that I sent you. Um, so I'm not sure if it's relevant or not. I just need to explore it. Maybe if I talk it out, maybe it'll, it'll make the connection. So I don't know where everybody's at with this, but I, the, in the top left of the slide, you'll see a diagram that's basically, if you've read Jordan Peterson's book, Maps of Meaning, or at least listened to a lot of his talks and stuff like that, this is sort of what he's getting at in terms of a map of meaning and, uh, basically their belief structures, the structure of things that you believe that map to you how to act out in the world. And then there's different maps that are, there's a meta map and then there's a map nested in that and then there's multiple maps nested in that and they go down and down and down into a specific set of actions. And so that's the, and so what I was thinking is in terms of trying to see what the relationship is between the kingdom of God and the information ecology. What if, if you if you look at that map, the kingdom or the, the square of what is that's representing 
the kingdom of uh, the known th known space, things that you know what is. And then okay. what you have is you have... So that would be like right here. Yep, that's it right there. And then okay. you have different maps. You have different uh, uh, frameworks that uh, belief structures that tell you how to get to what is. And that resides in the kingdom of or in basically in potential space it's the future and so i'm thinking that the kingdom of god you know whenever you, whenever you use the word kingdom or like father capital f or culture uh those are the things that are a space that you're comfortable in you you know what's going on and you know how to act it tells you how to act so the 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 ecosystem will it'll be it, you'll be in a space where whatever the chair when you enter into the room tells you how to act and you sit on it and so yeah I'm, it informs you of its use right so i'm trying so what i'm trying to see so there's not, attunement there's I'm participatory not, attunement yeah so i'm not so clear on it but i'm seeing something with i'm trying to draw in how the kingdom of god is acting as a maybe a a its own information ecology. I don't. I I'm just trying to connect those things. I'm seeing something there, and I'm I'm not, I'm not sure how to bring it out. <clears throat> so a spiritual kingdom, a spiritual king. If, so if God is a spirit, and God is, you know, we say He's omnipresent, and we. Um, you know, I try to think, find different ways to think about God. And if we have, if the kingdom of God is the information, yeah. <laughs> now, now my head's kind of spin a little bit. Yeah, I know. Maybe, maybe I'm putting, throwing us down a rabbit hole. But maybe if I explain what this, what's going on in this slide is basically in a, in a, in a generalized way, this is my attempt at trying to fuse and hopefully not confuse, but fuse the work that John Novaki <laughs> is doing with the work that Jordan Peterson has put out. And so uh -huh. if, you take, if you take the little orb that is white and blue, that's, you could say that's an object, that's a chair. And then the gray space is the object as a set of facts. So it has legs, it, it's made of wood. These are just objective facts about the chair that are as best you can possibly describe, void of any kind of purpose or meaning or anything like that. So descriptions then, of aspects of the yeah, thing. Exactly. So. The and are those, okay. So there are those phenomenological or are those numinous? Those would well. Can you? So, so yeah. phenomenological is whatever, whatever phenomena we experience of a thing. And then the numinous thing is the thing that really is that you may not perceive with your five senses. So I would I, I wouldn't say it's either of those. At least in the way I'm understand. At least in the way I'm presenting it to myself. In, 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 right, in, right. In really, it's just th thinking of it as if you could, as a as a as a set of facts about the world that are void of meaning. There's there's yeah. no there's no personal agent that is assigning any meaning to it, and there's no meaning that's inside of it that is to be ascertained in any way. Okay. So, okay. So the blue part is the meaning; it's the value of the object, and so the value of the object or the meaning of the chair informs. So you continue the blue line, and it hops into your maps of meaning. Okay. For, and this is so the maps of meaning is that's what I'm using as the architecture of your belief sets. So right? you can incorporate this thing into your map. This thing incorporates itself into your yeah. There's an exchange there, I guess. Because you could be, I mean, you could be delusional and in denial of its existence. You. Let me see. You know, like when you encounter novelty. Say you're following a map that isn't right, and you encounter novelty. Mm -hmm. Like, hey, the map doesn't say there's a tree here, but wow, there's this tree here. Well, I still think the map is right. That tree's not real. Okay. So right. there has to be a relation. Like when things incorporate themselves into your reality, it doesn't necessarily correspond with your map of reality until you allow your map to be updated by that thing. Right. So the way that I'm trying to 
to preserve continuity in this stu in this little image here is by using the color blue as the the line or f line of fluency of this is this is meaning this is where meaning is is anything that's the color blue is yeah. the is the right the line the fluid line of meaning and um, impetus towards action or values right okay so so the blue part of the chair goes into your maps of meaning right and mm -hmm. then what happens is your maps of meaning your belief sets uh, your intu your intuition it mm -hmm. informs your four types of knowing and this is where mm -hmm. it would be sort of a building block off of the last video we did on the formation of the of the four types of knowing and how they're dynamically uh, nested within in a in a nice matriska i think is what it's called matriska is the the russian nesting dolls russian nesting doll yeah that's what i think that, that's so, what I think it's called. i might be wrong but yeah so when the chair comes in you're mm -hmm. going to first participate with it like there's this thing mm -hmm. and then you're going to have some perspectival awareness you're probably going to look all around it to see what this thing is and you might ask somebody else what it is uh and you might observe the setting that it's in and then uh you might come up with some procedures for what you can do with it. Hey, I, this thing holds my body weight. I can rest on this thing. Right. And, so and then you're, you're and then you're going to put a label on that. Yes. Because okay. based based on a procedure that you've done with it, starting up from the bottom up to the point where you can put a label on it. Yes. Yes. And your maps of belief structure are the thing that's informing that form first. So I have a little note here that the map con forms the knowing space so it with forms knowing space and mm -hmm. then after if, if it's done correctly it, right this if, is if, if it functions correctly yes this is assuming that this is something that has um what is uh what what john verbeke i think would call fluency in what jordan hall i just got a hold of jordan hall like a week ago so he yeah call, um what would he call that we, the c um, Oh my God. Coherence. Coherence. That's it. The, so we have to say, as we're listing all these people, that we do not necessarily endorse everything that they endorse. If you go out and listen to these people, you have to understand that. <laughs> we're, we are separating the signal from the noise. So everybody bear that in mind. Do not think that when we say these people's names, we believe everything they believe or that we recommend everything they espouse. <laughs> nice all right. Nice Dis nice disclaimer nice. over. <laughs> um, so, so the maps of meaning there, the belief structure is informing, right? I'm sorry, it's conforming the knowledge space. So it's a, it's regulating and adjusting those those uh, the proper form. Right, right. And then what I have is the the little blue man is then radiating the blue, which is again meaning. It's the fluency. So that's the transformation and performing of this flow state, I guess you could say. So I think it's important to emphasize, I mean, I, don't, I know I already said this, but I need to emphasize that what you're describing here is, is if this works well with a more or less wise person who's transcended the ego and is not emotionally attached to a bad map. Because the phenomenon that I'm concerned with in Christianity is, myself included, we develop these maps of base reality that frankly are wrong and we don't really have a lot of interaction with base reality where error matters so that we can evaluate that it's wrong for example if you put a tire on wrong at the mechanic shop you're going to know that you did it wrong if if you do something wrong in theology you're not going to know that it's wrong so you can persist right. in a wrong map for a while and then Ian McGilchrist says, you know, the left hemisphere of the brain tends to construe a model of reality which is internally consistent, but not consistent with experience. And so people will actually choose their map over the phenomenon that comes in. Like the chair comes into their reality and they come up with an explanation for it that is not right. And that's what we call delusion. Um, so what, what I'm concerned with is people doing this poorly what you're describing is if somebody's doing it correctly. Yes, that's what this is an image, an, an attempted uh, uh, 
So, uh, so a, yeah, so a response to nuance and novelty would be a huge, the, the ability to respond to nuance and novelty without going into delusion is a huge component of what we're talking about here. Where if, and if you're following an ideological paradigm, you typically, a person does not do that well. They don't respond to novelty or nuance without going into delusion. They preserve the paradigm at the expense of being able to respond to reality. And then they lose touch with reality, base reality, and in, and in turn, have less meaning in their life. Yes, yes. So I think, I think we're looking at doing this correctly, not what we typically see. Right. And so I think that, so there's something to do with truth being the thing that is the proper convergence or proper uh, convergence of facts and meaning like this. And so that's what I'm trying at least to represent in these these little slides here. So if you if you just go up to just the first slide, well, yeah, can I? Well, can I? Because there's a good good segue right there for okay. something else that I want to emphasize too. Now you said you're looking for a convergence of facts and meaning, mm -hmm. and so you're talking about propositional facts, like statements, like truth claims, truth well, claims statements. I, I, well, I don't know. I don't, well, I wouldn't, I, let me presume that for a second. Okay. okay. <laughs> so, so let's look at this orb over here. We've talked about this before. Imagine that everything, all the words that we use are indexical markers. And imagine like on a, on a sphere that all these indexical markers are around the sphere and they're all pointing to something in the center. Okay. So, so one at a time, you, you only encounter these things one at a time. And you'd have to triangulate what they're all pointing to because you don't know with just one. You don't know with just two. You get a little bit better. So you start to increase your resolution at at least the direction that they're pointing to. And so eventually, eventually you come to realize that all these indexical marks, all these things that are being said, I'm separating the signal from the noise, and I get all the ones that I think have signal. They all seem to be pointing toward this thing in the middle. I don't know what that thing in the middle is. I have no idea what it is. I can't see it. I don't have any sensory perception with it, but they're all pointing at this thing. And over time, using discernment, uh, you know, you exercise your senses to discern both good and evil, Hebrews chapter 5, you can start to sense, even if you don't know exactly what that thing in the middle is, you can start to sense whether or not something else is pointing at it because of your familiarity with all the other things that you have ascertained are pointing at it. Does that make sense? And so there's... Um, there's almost like a like a hum or an echolocation kind of there's almost like a way you start to be able to feel or you start to be able to sense pretty strongly and with a high degree of uh, accuracy like a like a good what do you call it a good rate <laughs> a good batting average you know a good batting average of being correct at whether or not something is pointing at this thing and you might call that thing the logos, whether or not something is pointing at the logos correctly or not. So your job, our job in the information ecology is to make sure that all the indexical markers that are trying to point at a thing, and, and to look at the slide here, the thing um, could be in a different kind of space. Let me, uh, let me make it bigger for a second. And that kind of space, say you're pointing at something in procedural space, or perspectival space or participatory space and you are going to use words in proposition space to point at these other things right in these other kinds of knowing that don't have words and can't have words and every kind of word will necessarily be some sort of high fidelity loss data compression right but so your I your job is to ha is to make sure that all those indexical markers are pointing correctly at right. the logos right or at the procedure or perspective or participatory space and so you have a custodial relationship with propositional truth claims to make sure they're pointed in the right direction and that's kind of like another way of saying to tell the truth to have a to have a relationship with honesty is to make sure that the words that are used are constantly telling the truth, which is the opposite of what you would see 
in like a debate scenario, whether it's theology or politics, where people are playing war games and equivocating, that sort of thing. So we, we have to make sure that the indexical markers are pointing correctly and truly at the thing that they're attempting to d explain and not just being used frivolously. Right. So, so I think the thing you're talking about is, is involving the word that you use with, with fidelity, right? So yeah, this is, this is the, 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 the line and the conduit of the line that, that is basically, um, Stru structurally supporting whatever connection there is from reality, which is reality being what is true, what is true being the world of perfect convergence or, or uh, objective con convergence of, fa of facts and meaning. In so let's, yep. let's define truth as correspondence with reality. Okay. Yep. And so that's so that this would be the knowledge at each level is all corresponding with each other accurately with high fidelity. With high fidelity. Okay. So this brought me to Romans verse 1 uh or sorry, Romans chapter 1 verse 17 where Paul says um uh for it's like something like for therein is the righteousness of God revealed. And he's talking about the gospel from verse 16. But that the righteousness of God is revealed through the, con through the contents of the gospel, the truth of the gospel. In, but what's the, what's the bridge? It's from faith to faith. Okay? So there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a place where faith, faith touches some, some other faith. And I think that if you take that and you go to, um, where did I write this down? Right here. Uh, if you go to Romans chapter 10, verse 17, it's, yeah. so therefore, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And yeah. then you, you think of Galatians 5, 6, which is, uh, for I think something like uh, for circumcision or uncircumcision of uh, availeth nothing but faith that worketh by love, and I, Colossians chapter three verse fourteen says that um, charity is the bond of perfection, and so there's a lot of things to tie in there. But the base the basic thing that I'm getting at is that the line that brings the agent to the truth would be the the line and the conduit itself that structures it has something to do with a faith to faith and that that faith is is strengthened or made perfect perfectly ready by charity or love so there's this integral connection between sensing what is true and accessing faith in some way, and that faith being b being motivated or mo motored by love, it working working by love and charity, and that charity is the bond of perfection. So there's something there that I, that, that I'm loosely seeing. Right. So we need to define faith too, which is very key. So I think when we define faith properly, or if we try to, it really opens up what you're saying a lot. A lot of westernized Christians, they think of faith as a way which we can make unprovable things true, like unprovable proposition claims true. Mm -hmm. That is not what faith is. Uh, faith is faith is not something that... Let's just go to Hebrews 11.1. 1. Okay. It is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, and then all the examples that you get after that are people doing things like right. Abraham uh, Mo, <laughs> Abraham did not build the ark neither did Moses but Noah when he builds the ark if you look at the definition of faith let me go there if you don't mind real quick just to just to spell this out if I go to Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 and I bring this up on the screen 
that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, for by it the elders obtained a good report. It, they did not, it doesn't mean they believed something they couldn't prove to be true. Right, so by means of it, right? So there was some sort of perform, performance that, that allowed them to interact with the set of circumstances in front of them with fluidity or with, with, with a flow. Yeah. With a, uh, yes, with interact with the circumstance. Yes, yes, interact with the circumstances in front of them with, with fluidity, agency, purpose, and meaning. Mm -hmm. So by faith, Abel believed a bunch of propositions he couldn't prove. No, that's not what it says. Right, right. Um, look at Noah. By faith, Noah believed a bunch of propositions he couldn't prove. That's not what it says. He moved with fear, preparing an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and uh, became the heir of righteousness, which is, which is by faith. Abraham, by faith, when he was called to go out into a place, just believed a bunch of propositions that he couldn't prove were true. That's not what he did with faith. So we could go on. We could go on and on and on through these, and it gets kind of ridiculous after a while, but faith is like a, a loving commitment to bring something about that wasn't there before that is better for you and for others. And the, and the highest example we have of this is Jesus Christ who took on the responsibility of, of something that was not his, was not his problem. Just like the sin of the world was not Noah's problem, but he still had to take the action, take responsibility to build a boat for his family. So he takes the responsibility, he bears the cost of it. In the case of Jesus Christ, it cost him his life. In the case of Noah, think about what it cost them to, what a disruption of the manner of living it was to go through the flood. But you survive. And then all of mankind has him to thank for being alive. And you, it, it, that pattern of being able to take responsibility for something, to bring something to pass that was not there before, kind of like a bridge builder, mm -hmm. where you commit in faith. I, I don't, we walk by, by faith, not by sight. Like you're building a bridge. I do not see the bridge there yet. But I am operating in faith that if I continue to follow, like design this blueprint and build this bridge, that some people can cross this bridge. And you have to have faith to do anything like that because you can't see it before you do it. You cannot see the bridge before you start. You cannot see the end state of the effort of your faith before you start. Now, I start talking this way and people start talk, saying, oh, you're trying to talk about work salvation. And I'm not. You're missing the point. You're missing the point. But the, the living faith of a Christian has this, like you were saying, the correspondence with the fluency of, re what was it you were saying, with, with agency and fluency towards something. Right. Well, you were saying that it, like, faith has something to do with the evidence of things not seen, right, per Hebrews 1.11. Right. Yep. Or 11, 11 one. Sorry. <laughs> um, but, <laughs> so the bridge is the thing you can't see. But also before you moved into like the scriptural understanding of it, you were saying that, that the truth as this little orb is also something that you can't see. You yes. can't make pointers at it through proposition sets and you hope that the proposition or the, at least let, let's say at least the language space is properly pointing to each procedural level. So that when it gets to the level of participation, the participation, the line of participation to the thing that is true, is with fidelity, and it's in it. Yes, it, yes. It, it's it's making a a corrected uh, line of convergence so that the truth just pops right out. With fidelity. right, so we have a, a we have a pointer at the thing, but you need. You need a bunch of pointers at the thing, and even with all the pointers, you still don't have the thing. You you have to have a relationship with whatever the thing is, and those pointers can help you build that, but they are not it. Mm. So, so it's like the definite. It's like the difference between between complex and complicated. Certain okay. certain things are complicated. Like God would definitely be in the realm of complex. And if you can describe something with finite propositions, it is most definitely not complex. It can only be complicated. Therefore, you cannot, with finite propositions, say completely true things, like, like exhaustively true things about God. Mm -hmm. You can say things that aren't false, 
but you cannot be you cannot have exhaustive correspondence with reality about God when it comes to the complexity of God using finite propositional truth claims. So to get a little bit of an understanding to keep people along here, because this is something that I came across the complex and the complicated just and I don't think I have it fully or even coherently formulated. So let me just give an attempt at it. So I understand the complex to be, let's just say, the internetworking of of the orb of what's true. And what is complicated is the interworkings of the agent's attempt to attune itself with the arena or with what is true and the in any particular up, instance up of that. Yep. Yep, yep, yep. So so well, not necessarily mucking it up, but there, uh, you could have a recognition of your capacitative limits, and you're not necessarily mucking anything up. You just recognize the lack of exhaustiveness with which you can operate. So the infinite, the infinite numinous can only present, it cannot present all of itself to you at any one time. It can only present it to you in, in an instanti- a, a particular instantiation. And you can interact with that instantiation, but you have to, the proper relationship with the infinite numinous is to recognize that 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 particular instantiation of it is not it. Mm -hmm. It is just a particular instantiation of it with which you can interact. And if you can interact with it, then by definition, it is not the thing. It is, it it, it can only be complicated. It can't be complex. So, but a whole bunch of interactions with the infinite numinous can help you point to the complex the complex right okay to give you a sense of it gotcha because that's that's something that's still i'm still trying to get a hold of what jordan hall is kind of talking about well well, some people confuse the bible for god the bible is the word of god but they they treat the bible like it's god i Mm -hmm. think somebody said in their last fsi meeting they said something about worship i think james might have said something about worship in the bible do people worship the bible and absolutely Mm -hmm. they do it's uh, it's just like uh if a window was built so that you could see what's through it some people might worship the window instead of just use it to see what's through it right (laughs) You know, just use the thing to see what's through it and quit worshiping the thing as if it's what you're supposed to be looking at. Mm-hmm. You know? Yes. So, where are we at here? I had a thought and it escaped me, unfortunately. I can, I can help you have some more escape you. <laughs> Um, man, I, this is, this keeps just inputting in and I I don't, I don't know why. So I don't know if this is helpful, relevant or anything, but my wife and I just finished watching the movie, uh, Avengers Age of Ultron. Have you seen that? Yeah, don't tell the independent Baptists. (laughs) So (laughs) this is the one where, uh, Ultron is the bad guy and he's kind of a cybernetic hybrid kind of dude and he replicates himself a million times and lives on the internet as well as a whole bunch of robots of himself yes and what he tries to do so this is so interesting is he tries so he's a the reason he he he's birthed is because tony stark it basically uh, generates him but Tony Stark generates him in a, in a time when he's in a propositional conundrum about uh, in propositional contradiction about what is the right thing to do. Should I make peace or should I make war? And- so, yeah, to clarify, so Ultron is supposed to be a like a friendly defense mechanism. Yes, that's the that's, that's its intent. Right, but it's kind of like a Roman 7 kind but of situation. But it wind, winds up going Skynet. It's kind of like a what situation? It's kind of like a, it becomes a, a Roman 7 situation. I don't think or, I'm familiar with that. Okay, so, no, Roman 7. Like, um, when... when oh, when, oh. Sorry. <laughs> I thought you were using, like, a figure of speech. Like, there's a... Like, to decimate me. You know, like a certain move that the Roman army did. I'm, I'm smoking crack. 
I picked the wrong week to quit sniffing glue. So so Tony Stark creates him creates him in a with a mindset of Paul in Romans chapter seven, where for the good that I would, that I do not, and the good that I would not, that or that I do. And so Tony Stark wants to make peace on earth, but when he tries to do that, he makes all of this these problems. And then when he tries to eradicate those problems, you know, it, it never goes the way he wants it to. And so he creates Ultron as a solution for this. And so part of Ultron's proceed, um, what's it called, protocol, is to solve yeah. this false dichotomy. Okay. Yeah. And so what happens is, in the middle of all this, um, Ultron takes over uh, 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 Tony Stark's original. Uh, um, artificial intelligence named Jarvis. And right, right. the time at which Tony Stark created Jarvis, he created him as a protocol uh, with a protocol initiative, not as a not a, not with the initiative initiative of solving some sort of uh, moral dilemma. Okay. Oh, so, oh yeah. Okay, so he created uh, Jarvis at a time where he needed a pr uh, some sort of a procedural aid. So he uh, can only follow formulas. He can only follow, fo right, yes. Yeah, so he can only He follow. can't separate signal from noise. He can't do discernment. He Not can just first. follow programming. Not at first. He's right. just protocol. And then he develops, you know, the ability to understand things at, 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 at uh, more superficial levels and more human levels or whatever. So what ends up happening is Ultron uh, basically tears uh, Jarvis into a million pieces, right? And then later on in the movie, you find out that Ultron took apart all of more or less uh, Jarvis's propositional knowledge space. But because yeah. he was created to be a, a protocol with, with proto the protocol initiative, Ultron didn't decimate him so jarvis's protocol initiative brought him back together and allowed him to basically fend off the uh the initiatives of ultron and then he gets infused with the mind stone and then becomes an actual participatory uh you know uh, he becomes agentic in the physical world yes and what you see is that Watching the processing of when uh, um, Jarvis becomes vision, which is insight, right? He's able to f he's able to look through a problem because he gets presented to the Avengers as the solution to the, pro the to all these problems that they have, these moral dilemmas and all these things, and he solves them. You watch him actually in the movie like process the conundrum or the, uh, the, the moral dilemma, the false dichotomy, and it, it, it's, he's always relying on his procedural protocols and ends up ultimately defeating Ultron. And, and, and so anyway, where I wanted to... So just to, well, I don't want to disrupt you too far, but I just want to make a comment for anybody watching is that this is the proper way to have a relationship with literature is to bring everything you think about life and understand about life and see and examine the literature to see how it plays out in the story. Okay, so maybe that's going to bring us into the one thing I wanted to bring into this conversation in terms of tr how, how do we understand um, and have a custodial, uh, a custodial relationship with the information ecology that is um, responsible and with fidelity. And so one thing that I've been in, been given insight to is the the, po the proposition basically, and and we can talk about the consequences of this and where it goes, but that we should shift the vector of sacredness from narrative, uh, and that narrative, God as character, or, or the world as 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 layers of narrative. And, and, and shift that to dialogue, which is God as that which moves 
through fluency and right uh, yeah i see what you're saying so that which can only be manifested in some kind of interaction yes and i think that that interaction is going it's probably to poorly much. worded but yeah. yeah but the interaction is going to be for therein is the righteousness of god revealed from faith to faith oh and my it, what, what it, passage is that again uh that's romans 1 verse 17 uh, right after so for so therein, i mean you're, you're yeah. making me think of like a flow state and if you have a flow state and if you multiply that exponentially by interaction with other people you have a a coherence that yes. can emerge uh, from a flow make, state you're starting to make this faith network okay yep and for therein is the righteousness of god revealed from faith to faith and remember we said that and for faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word by the word of god which is truthful the truthful articulation of speech from the right, from right. Or proper fluency or attunement or coherence of the numinous or that which is sacred through the epistemological epistemic levels of the four types of knowing and out through speech and so right. faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of god and a faith that works by love and that, that then it comes into in the, that charity is the bond of perfection which you then you go look at um first corinthians 13 and all that stuff but moving moving back what would it mean for us to shift and the, the whole purpose of this shift is to be more responsible to have a greater skill level at being good custodians of the kingdom of god and representing better representatives of the hope that is within us and the the savior that is within us and so what would it mean for us to shift um the vector of sacredness from narratives to a dialogue <laughs> so you would go well it's interesting I, i'm not thinking about so many things now because you would go from i want to say you would go from propositions to a process but narratives cry for a process well, they have a they, there's a narrative is in a sense i think a it's a process it's a story for example like if i could give you a list of 10 truths right mm -hmm. that so say i get 10 truths out of a little story and here's the 10 morals of the story if i just give you the morals of the story that's all you have but mm -hmm. if i give you the story you can re-extract those 10 morals and you can probably extract a thousand more so a story, either a narrative, and uh, it's something I'm kind of toying with, either a narrative or perhaps poetry is a way to use statements, language, with, and I don't know if you, it's not that it's not compressed, and it's not that there's not a high fidelity loss, but it's also, it, it's almost like somehow it is compressed at a point where all the information can be brought back out somehow it can, it can be re-extracted back out okay and then so, when you have dialogue it's it, <laughs> imagine you're a prospector looking for oil when you have dialogue with somebody it's almost like when you come together if god is at the center or the logos is at the center of the sphere it's almost like you can have you can drill down in in the interaction you can drill down to the thing but to the with, logos but with but, the dialogue it's two there's two agents yes that are and you're drilling down which means that there's a there's an enhanced bandwidth of well yeah and you can't leave with that though you you cannot you cannot gain the capacity to access the logos and then walk away with it it, it only exists in the dialogue you right. see what i'm saying so when you stop talking to each other and you both, you know, turn your back on each other and start to walk away, that access to the base reality and the correspondence with reality also goes away. 
Right, it dissipates in a in a. Because it's it's like it's a key to it's like the dialogue, the interactive dialogue is the key to access it. Well, it makes me think of when Jesus says, "For where two or three or more are gathered in my name, there uh -huh. I am in the midst." Yes. And so, one of the techniques that I think is helpful in this this process, or at least this uh, initiative of using dialogue to uh, access the what is sacred, what is meaningful, um, the numinous, what is true, yeah. all of those things is the this little uh, distinction that that I heard, and I can't remember where I heard it, but there's a distinction between what's called conditional and absolute learning. And so as I understand it, which is not very well, but condition or uh, absolute learning is the type of learning that we, when we're engaged with another person, this is the type of learning that we like to do. And it's very, very, very propositional in nature. It's very propositionally tyrannizing in, 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 in its nature. It's like, so if, um, I have a I have a mouse right here. You, and you mean like we we like to do it as we enjoy it, or we like to do it we prefer it as a society because it's the most efficient and scalable. I think it's it's scalable, but it's absolute. So it gives it it provides this this. Uh, oh, we would crave this. It, it scratches the itch of the certainty craving. Ex because it, exactly because it gives it this veil of certainty. It's right. It's a great way to word it. The veil of certainty. Yes. We crave certainty and we, we are satisfied and we feel like we can rest when we think we have it. Right. Because the truth is not to be found in the little gray area of facts, but the truth is to be found, like we said, in the proper convergence or coherence of facts and meaning. And so, <laughs> so what this would do if people crave certainty, this would incentivize people who are engaged in information exchange. Mm -hmm. This would incentivize them to deliver certainty at the expense, to deliver the illusion of certainty yes. at the expense of propositions that might actually correspond with reality. Right, and so what that's gonna get into is the the idea that you're, get, you're getting with propositional inflation. So put that to the side for two seconds and I'll explain the other the other side of this th this learning dichotomy, and so there's another type of learning which is not absolute learning, but is but what I'm seeing is called conditional learning. And so now, mm -hmm. when I'm teaching a child, I would I would uh, about the mouse that's on my desk right here, I would tell them in absolute learning that this is a mouse. So if we're engage so if I'm engaging with this child. And then I just take over the the participatory space. I take over. The... I just lost your audio. Oh, sorry. There we go. Better. Yeah. Okay. So, if if I'm engaging with a child and I'm going to teach them something, in absolute learning, I'm going to tyrannize the propos or the uh, uh, the part the participatory space, the perspectival space in the procedural space and then give them the proposition this is a, a mouse now a conditional learning space which i think is a technique you can use in in dialogue that holds more fidelity is conditional learning which would be the child is next to me and i'm engaging with the child and then instead of me propositionally or tyrannizing the the space i go I could ask a question. I could say, "What What do you think that is?" I or I. It, it can be more uh, uh, conditional. So it's like, "This is really bad," but this could could this be a mouse, or this looks like a thing that is called a mouse. So do you see where I'm doing? I'm I'm conditioning the statement to better yep. suit the flexibility the epistemological flexibility space of the person who's learning. And so it's more exploratory in nature and more flexible to the other person's uh, epistemological or four types of knowing. 
So that would be conditional learning. So yeah. Um, that so you kind of yeah you kind of interact with the person to kind of make them exercise their like make them exercise their epistemological muscles. Yes. Yes. You're not just spoon feeding them. You're not tyrannizing. You're not. It's it's kind of like you're, you're making them peel their own shrimp before they eat it. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Which is good. Yeah. So now that I that I picked up on this, it's like when I'm speaking with someone because I have a huge tendency to just to go full send and say exactly what this is and give this whole ontology on the thing. And yeah. This has caused me to uh, to back up and put myself in a more exploratory uh, a space with the person that I might be speaking with and yep, yep. allows room for their participation with the numinous or with whatever the object is to inform me in some, in some fashion. And um, so conditional versus absolute learning, I think has been huge in developing my understanding of the value of um, maybe not putting so much stock in telling somebody what the narrative is, what the story is, and then just relying on the power of that story to basically inform that person in their other types of knowing and right. move into an actual more dialogue where now this it's like i'm going a layer below narrative stories in the in the maps of how people extrapolate meaning and uh, an acquiesce impetus towards action and i'm now participating with them in a different way that encourages and doesn't tyrannize or tell them what the story of the mouse is and engage with them in a way where now we're actually part of the story in some way. Yeah, yeah. We're more participating in our Bible study because mm -hmm. we're using the inductive method, which mm -hmm. means, which is exploratory in nature, which means that we have to put ourselves in some fashion into the situation perspectively, working those perspectival muscles and participate or, or, or imagine what it would feel like to, you know, be crucified with Christ or something like that. And so now I'm moving a level below, I think, just semantic narrative story in a sense. And I'm engaging with the, uh, the agent who is ne next to me or, you know, in some fashion. And I think that this might be a more powerful way to, to engage with reality and ascertain truth. So it's, it's almost, when you say that, it's almost like rivalrous interaction is the kryptonite of that thing. Yeah. This so, is so, so let's take it this way. Um, if you are in, if you are in rivalrous dynamic where you're debating, the further you get, the higher you go up this direction toward proposition space. So if, can I can if, I say something before you keep going? So okay. by rivalrous, by nature, we're in a in a in an arena where. There is a competition for yep. someone to gain access to items on the value structure right, before right. someone else, or for for some sort of strategic game, game theory advantage reason. That's game theory, would... mm -hmm. evolutionary game, game theory. theory. Okay, yeah. So I'm with you now. Yep. So when you're when you're in game theory, game A is what some would call it. You are using a rivalrous dynamic, and you're you're basically disambig disambiguating semantic propositions in order to establish some kind of superiority and gain some kind of victory in the realm of propositional truth claims. What you don't realize is that you're doing this at the expense of the deeper kinds of truth. 
-hmm. So non-rivalrous interaction is like a drill or a portal, is like a portal down into the deeper kinds of knowing down toward the logos. Rivalrous interaction is kryptonite to that, and it takes you up into the shallow end of the pool where you can only deal in propositions, and you completely have no relationship whatsoever with whatever is more deeply true that that so, propositions cannot cover. So you're saying that it encourages premature... Uh, what's the What would be the word that we would use where of this map here the it's 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 like it's encouraging an arena attunement that it encourages premature optimization of yes opposition sets like let me get to the yes. let me participate perspectival process and get to the proposition set before this person and then say that this is true right right so you can you could you could achieve semantic disambiguation to the satisfaction of a crowd that might be willing to even you might be rewarded for that somehow monetarily or by hier hierarchical or prestige status but you have not gotten any closer to truth. So what do you if that's a good point what are you optimizing for? Are you optimizing to discover truth? Or are you optimizing to convince a bunch of people that you have a better handle on it than somebody else? Okay. And those are two very different things. So this is this is an important thing to tie into the difference between uh, accessing the sacred through narrative versus accessing the sacred through dialogue. One of these reasons is because narrative stories have characters, and so. What ends up happening, I think, what's been happening is the the way that somebody extracts meaning out of the narrative is yeah. by identifying with a character and a, a set of propositions of our premature optimization. You kind of identifies with a character. What you cut out for a second? Sorry, it it's it identifies with a character um, prematurely. And, and, oh, man, I just lost it. It was, <laughs> <laughs> this is so hard. <laughs> it is. Um, but well worth it. So what I'm trying to get at is the, the danger with narrative. Actually, I had a quote here. Oh, I think that said it is, what was it? It was that. Man, so n narratives encourage you to extrapolate out which character you were in the iteration and then have a, a positive feedback loop that tells you, oh, I should be that character again. And that character that you just played in the next iteration might not be the proper character to, caricature to act out in that situation. So what can that's where the, the power of of uh, of trying to extract meaning out of the numinous or out of the sacred or out of the reality through a the method of dialogue with somebody would would say something like it would encourage the process of the thing so instead of me telling somebody after they made a great soccer play you're a great soccer player because then in their mind, they're the hero in that narrative. Yeah. They identify with it, and then they try to create other iterations of that by manipulating their environment and manipulating other people so that they can be, other, uh, they can be a good soccer player. Right. But if I focus more on a positive feedback loop that is procedural in nature and more participatory with the person by saying, that play you just made was so great, they, they don't identify with a character they identify with a procedure, a procedure. Okay. That's what I wanted. So, to so yeah, the Greeks have two words for wisdom and one of them is Sophia and the other one's phrenesis. And Sophia is an overarching theory of wisdom and phrenesis is more what is a contextually appropriate wise thing to do now or in each situation. So it's kind of like in, uh, in the Bible, the difference between, well, at least I was told 
and I, I think it's almost, it, it's not exactly, exactly right, but that charity is love in action. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So let me finish. Okay, so we said that premature optimization of proposition sets, what that does is that optimizes propositional truth claims. Yeah. To coalesce around and a priori paradigm. with persuasive power mm. at the, the expense rivalry. that's where the rivalry comes yes in. at the expense of using dialogue to further discover truth so yeah, if you're in a debate with somebody, you you are not in exploratory manner. You have already decided what you think is true. And you are just honing the propositions whereby you may persuade somebody that what you have already decided is true is in fact true. And you're persuading them. You're scratching the certainty itch and you're persuading people. And when you persuade people, that puts you in kind of in an in-group because they accept you for having convinced them that something is true. And then it kind of puts you somewhere at least in the prestige hierarchy. Now they hold you in higher prestige, maybe higher competence hierarchy when, with regard to your ability to use words. And maybe in a, you know, that kind of thing, maybe in a power hierarchy too. So they might promote you to be the head of the thing if you can do this sufficiently well enough. So I would put James White in this category where he is really good at convincing people and persuading people that his a priori decision of what is truth is in fact true because he can deliver propositional certainty and very gifted at coalescing a bunch of semantic disambiguation around promoting a certain paradigm mm -hmm. as true. He's very good at doing that, but he has no capacity whatsoever to actually explore and find out what truth is. Mm. And he's completely handicapped in that area. He will, he will never interact. And I'm not just talking about him. This isn't a dig on him. It's anybody who's ideologically possessed. They will never, they will never interact. They will never have any meaning in their life. They will never interact in the deeper kinds of knowing or ever have any correspondence with reality or, or any of that. Never do any of that. Um, so here's what... Some of, the, some of the other things that I wanted to get at. Um, if we're having propositional knowledge to the other three is words, right? Yeah, like language space. Or is, um, you know, we're going to call these are measured in truth claims. So of the other three kinds of knowing, and let me write them down real quick. Uh, below this, you would have uh, procedural Mm -hmm. And then you would have perspectival, and then you would have participatory. So each one of these, if you want to exchange in for pr procedural knowledge, like if you and I exchange procedural knowledge, it's going to be at the propositional levels, what we're doing right now. Right. If we're going to exchange perspectival knowledge, it's got to be at the propositional level. If we're going to pr exchange participatory knowledge, it's got to be at the propositional level. And we can do that depending on how, on how well established the standardization of the language is. Let me give you an example. Um, let's say that I'm not a Navy SEAL. I'm an Army guy, and I wasn't even a Green Beret. But let's say two... Two Navy SEALs are talking to each other, and one of them talks, you know, they're not even in the same year group or whatever, but they start talking about going to Bud school. Well, automatically, the other Navy SEAL is going to have a whole list of participatory knowing with which he can fill in the scaffolding of that label. The guy says Bud school. To most people, that means nothing. To many, or to many people, it means very little other than having seen a few things in a few movies which might not be accurate at all. 
but another Navy SEAL would know. So there's a high level of fluency because the label means something very similar to these two different people, right? And so what you might say is you take all that experience and I've, I've abstracted it down to a label so I could exchange it with somebody else and then they take it as a scaffolding and then they rebuild all the participatory knowing back around it. And your ability to do that determines how effective the communication is. And when the communication completely breaks down, it could either not be there or we could be speaking different languages. Like if I was speaking Mandarin right now, you probably wouldn't have any idea what I was saying, and neither would I. Of course. Because there's, there's, nothing, there's nothing at the deeper, th there has to be something at the three deeper levels of knowing that you can relate these labels to in order for them to, to mean convert, something to you. have a convergence of facts and meaning. Yes, yes, convergence of facts and meaning. There you go. So you think about the abstraction of, like in society, I've, I've been thinking about this idea that propositional knowledge is the currency of the other kinds of knowing. Mm -hmm. Because in, in society, m currency and money is the abstraction of goods and services. Right. Like, I, like a guy just mowed my yard today, called me lazy. And, uh, I, you know, I paid him for it. So he can take that. He's, he doesn't have to go somewhere and trade yard mowing for whatever goods and services he wants. He can take that money and go get whatever he wants with it because we have all agreed as a society to abstract goods and services to a certain degree of this Unit. stuff. Yeah. Right. So, so I, can, I, can liqui I can liquidate goods and services to a currency and then... What, what's the opposite of liquidation? <laughs> then reinstantiate them back into reality as something else. Like I can take money from my job and I can instantiate that into a car, mm -hmm. you know? So if, if, when you lose the capacity to do that, so, so what can happen to currency? It's, it's scalable. You can move it a lot faster than you can move goods and services. Mm -hmm. The more standard it is, the, so standardization increases fluency. The more standard it is, the more usable it is. The more goods and services can be abstracted into a currency. So what is currency at risk of? It's at risk of inflation. It's at risk of pollution in a sense, maybe uh, quantitative easing for <laughs> that'd also be inflation though. Um, it's a, it's at risk of forgeries and it is, it is subject to these things. It is subject to these things. So if you had a disjunct society that was like everyone started speaking, everyone started developing add-ons to the English language on their own at their own pace, you and I wouldn't be able to have these conversations. What, you know, what are we, like a thousand miles apart from each other? Which is what's happening with um, lingo or um, uh, what's it called? Like, <laughs> what would it be called? Slang? Slang. That's, a, that's what I was looking for. Yeah. So, so, so you have an un unofficial degradation of the currency and then therefore the currency is worth less so if i want to explain if i want to say bud school if a, if a navy seal wants to say bud school to another navy seal that that is sufficient if you want to say it to somebody who has no idea what you're talking about you have a lot of explaining to do you have to tell stories you have to you have to use a thousand different things so um <laughs> Rivalrous dynamic, debating. What debating, debating is like quantitative easing because there are word games that are played. Mm -hmm. Like if you ever talk to a Calvinist, they're equivocating left and right. The words never mean the same thing they said they mean at the beginning. They'll give you a definition of monergism and then when you call them on it later, they won't stick to it. And all right. of a sudden words stop to retain their meaning. Right, what you've pointed out numerous times is that when you try and pin... So, uh, somebody who's ideologically possessed and the example yep. of the, 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 the caricature is always a Calvinist is that you pin them down with the word. And then what they do is they fractionate the word into two, two different things. That's right. That's exactly right. God becomes the perceptive will and the decretive will. Yeah. I got the preceptive will and decretive will. So words stop meaning things. Right. So there's a, there's a big gap between non-Calvinists and Calvinists because People even joke about it. Calvinists have their own definition, their own dictionary. That's what they were. 
so you have this inflation of information and the more the more rivalrous you are the more you are contributing to the inflation of knowledge currency right. because the thing that separates us from the animals is you're, because your objective in the rivalrous dynamic is not in the in the sense of dialogue or dialect where both figures are making a priority or making a value of the uh, of drilling down to value itself or, or right. fact values itself truth the reality you're aimed at at the the process somewhere in here making sure that your process is the most efficient one to get to that first and then bring it back up to the surface and propagate it and no not even that not even that so that that would be better than what's actually happening what's actually happening you don't actually have to get truth you have to persuade people that you have it well well so you see what right, i'm saying so, but what i'm saying is that once once that that dive is done quickly and then brought back up because of time it's lost a lot of a lot of con consideration it's a lot of, lost a lot of custodial relationship but when it gets when it when it's back up at the surface at the propositional level and it gets pinned down in in the form of a challenge it yeah. goes uh, oh no this is not true it's a lie and then it fractionates and it goes oh but this is what i meant and then a yep, new word yep. comes up and then comes back up and you go up. Oh, that's not it either. And then that fractionates and then it goes down and then it comes back up. And this is, this is that, the, that process, I think. So the lack of correspondence with reality gives birth to this fractioning process. I think it's the orientation of the process in the first place. The process is rivalrous in nature. So, so yep. So the propositions are oriented, they're optimized for persuading people that you yeah. already have truth, mm -hmm. now, uh, rather than actually finding truth. And also this, if, if I do better, if I survive better, or I get what I want because of the number of people that are persuaded that I have truth, if I can scratch their certainty itch and get them to start following me, then it is in my best interest if you think fitness landscape you know, evolutionary game dynamic, and I'm not supporting evolution, just evolutionary game dynamic is what I'm talking about, because people, people, I'm telling you, people. <laughs> and now I can't even remember what I was trying to say, because I'm worried about the people. But if you, <laughs> if you take, if you're trying to persuade people of this, you will be, in, once you do find truth, mm -hmm. you will be incentivized to keep other people from it so that you can still be perceived as the guy who has it. Exactly. So, so if I have truth and you have truth, now they don't have to come to me anymore. Now they can come to you and get truth. And then you might show them how to actually get truth on their own. Now they don't need us anymore. So it's, it's like this uh, emotional personality disorder where they need to be needed so rather okay. than they need to be in correspondence with truth. I'll, I'll be quiet. No, 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 no. So this, this language actually comes out in the greatest form in Christianity when I interact with Christians and they say this phrase, well, I have the truth. And that's like a possessive statement about, well, I have the absolute they're in, truth. They're in having mode. Ex ex exactly. And it's like, yep, that's right. Up as a man and it says, listen, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. It's like, so... <laughs> Could you imagine the audacity of saying something like I own like it's like I am the I am I can propositionally tyrannize the truth to such an extent that it's actually mine and no one else's. So this is what this is what cultivates cultural narcissism because it's like this is my truth and I have it and now I'm the only propagator of the thing that can throw it out to everybody else. And it's right, like, right. This is like this is really crazy. You're the expert. You're the guru. Exactly. And and so that when I hear that statement, you know, because it it can be very securing or convicting, 
to be around somebody who you have some sort of um, convergence with in terms of like, well, you know, I believe I believe in the, the gospel and stuff like that. I'm saved. And so I have the truth. And it's like you have some convergence there and it can be a little bit, you know, securing and um, and reassuring, reassuring, mm -hmm. you know, it, but what I think it really does propagate is the uh, I, I think it really does propagate an incentive for cultural narcissism, because that means that the truth is something not that anyone else can interact with in any way, but something that has to outflow from your the the empty holes that you have inside that are completely unarticulated and that you just fill with the uh the pseudo gap of the truth whatever that whatever that is it's like you're not even close you're not even you're not even scratching the surface of the um of the gravity in the weight of a statement like that Exactly. There's no yeah. Gravity is a good word. So when you say cultural narcissism, I guess you could probably also say in-group narcissism, because mm. there's subcultures. But you know, like whatever your church is, you think your church or your denomination has the truth. That kind of thing. Yeah. I have the truth because, and it's a having. You're in having mode, and so you're emotionally identified with something, and then whenever somebody challenges the thing that you think you have, you go into fight or flight response mode and your body goes into defensive mode, at which point also you are less open emotionally because your limbic system has been hijacked and you're less capable of processing something and discerning whether or not it's true when you encounter it anyway. So let's say you're in a, <laughs> if you are in a debate scenario and you're debating somebody and they say something that happens to be true because you're in defense mode, you will be less likely to be able to discern it. Yeah, I actually. You just won't have the capacity. Yeah, I this. <laughs> this happens a lot when I when I listen to to someone like James White because he's he's very 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 good at keeping fidelity with his propositional truth statements as mere propositions. Like right. it, does, it doesn't move outside of that knowledge space. Right. So you can mistake that uh, the convergence you might have with that true proposition space for, well, that's true all the way down the stack. You know what I'm saying? In a good, in a proper representation um, or articulation of, uh, of, of reality. And then right, when, right. when you step back and then you, you, you you go and interact with the world like go to your job for example it, it might occur to you or strike you when you were listening to you know uh, some kind of group or propagator of a, a a culture or a paradigm that is so uh, so that ha that you have that propositional convergence with it's like oh my gosh it's like being in a whole nother world like, for example, I, like I went to uh, a Presbyterian church the other day, and it felt, when I was in there, like I was in this completely proxy world. It was amazing to me. And wow. then when I spent time with the same people that were in that church, and we just sat in a living room and had a conversation for like four and a half hours, it was like... I mean, I, I, this is this is a much more uh, true, and it resonated m more authentically as real and true than than in the church service. Exactly. Then, then in this building, that's like walking through a paradigm portal where, <laughs> and. And it really, it's kind of creepy just because of where I've been. And it's like, you know, we make fun of people who uh, fall into cults and are doing all these very strange ritualistic things. And it's like, if you would just step back and look at the absurdity 
of what churches are doing and rubbing that up against the the just the raw authority of scripture it's like where is this where is this in scripture and i don't mean that scripture has to have this proposition set that says you know you're supposed to have a liturgy and a in a eucharist and in and, and take the sacraments of this that and that. i don't know that's not what i'm talking about i'm talking <laughs> i'm talking about having being in a mindset where your mind is aimed on a moment to moment basis of accessing your epistemology so that it is in fluid attunement and coherence with what the present reality is and not letting anything that is in the arena or, or, or in the, the, the current circumstances, the setting or the context of where you are be a thing that puts this portal or lens over you that like, is like, like eyes glazing over it is it's totally oh my gosh it was so it was it was quite an experience but it's like i it's so in it's so integral to the american culture of going to church yeah. and in walking through these these ritualistic procedures that that um i, I it really, it really has come to light more and more that it's like, can we move away from the storytelling, the false storytelling that's going on in these, these rituals? And because that's what they're doing is they're acting out a story. They're acting right, out. Right, right. That's of, exactly okay, right. I'm this role. I'm going to be the priest, or I'm going to be the, the the whatever the preacher, and then you're going to be the sheep. And then you're going to come up and get your your piece of bread. Like you're going to do all of these. You're going to act at a play just like children do in middle school. And yep. you're going to say all of the lines of the script because you have to memorize them. And then when he says this, then you say that. And replace this, this storytelling or this story acting out with taking a step, going a step deeper and saying, a more powerful and more base way to access reality what is true is through a custodial developing a network of custodial relationships with the information ecology with through the means of a dialogue a dialectic or a dialogue process <clears throat> in leaving room for, for 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 all of that and then so you so you're specifying a process and, and, and now what you're doing is, is bringing in like, okay, so what are the, what are the, the threat vectors for th this kind of processing? And you're using the, the, the powerful analogy of currency to show how this is how, this is how a, a, the proposition space can make a, uh, a, a pseudo world with fake values because yeah. propositions become fake values because they're not holding fidelity to truly what is the, co the true convergence of facts and meaning. Right. There's, there's inflation. And so, so like we are, you know, we talk about the problem of propositional tyranny and we're, it's not that we're against the use of propositions. It, they're so helpful but we become over reliant upon them to the ex to the exclusion of the other types of knowing and that is very costly and it costs us the value of the propositions it's just like having having money is extremely is extremely beneficial for a society you can just look at like the stat this you know the <laughs> the statistics like Steven Pinker has pointed out where whenever you have you know societies with currency and things like that everybody gradually does better and better and better and better over time right. and that's that's been demonstrated and you can you can greatly improve things and propositional knowledge can have that role but at the same time when it goes bad it goes very bad and if you became propositionally bankrupt you would no longer have a currency by which you could exchange knowledge with other people 
I mean, imagine it's like the to the Tower of Babel is a perfect example of that. Yeah, yeah, all absolutely. the all of a sudden, nobody can exchange. No, there is no currency for the other for the other three kinds of knowing. Wow, it doesn't exist. Hmm. <laughs> and then you know, to the things we were talking about earlier, some other notes that I have here, and we got to probably got to wrap this up. But um, once you, if you're trying to in a rivalry situation. You don't win by finding the truth. You win by persuading other people that you found the truth. And because you're trying to instantiate, your, you're trying to establish yourself in, within a hierarchical in-group as important to that in-group. Mm. So the more people you can convince that you have the truth, the better. And convincing them is the point of value, not actually having the truth. Right, right, right. So this comes yeah, into the... the it's the acceptance of yes. the dollar that they give you or that you're handing out that is moment yeah. of triumph. Yeah. Yes. So so a societal niche is functional even if it's completely wrong, it is fit to survive if there are enough people in it that can make it survive. That's all it needs is a number of people. If you have enough people, you can live any kind of shared narrative no matter how much of a lie it is. So when people talk about Oh, this great missionary, you know, convinced, you know, won all these people to Jesus. No, they, they persuaded a whole bunch of people to accept a, propos a set of propositions as true without being epistemically validated, telling me they're converted to anything. That kind of gets into another issue. But if I'm trying to persuade Christians that I have the truth in a rivalrous dynamic where I'm like debating theology versus other theology where everybody in the audience is some kind of Christian already, what, what I'm going to be tempted to do is start start appealing to their virtues. Mm. If they hold exactly. something as virtuous, and then, then I'm going to start virtue signaling. And I'm going to try to present myself to them as if I embody the virtues that they value, even if I don't actually embody them. And it causes me to lack transparency. It causes me to be fake. Mm -hmm. uh, virtue, and now, now I am... You know, you, I, your identity is something that you negotiate with other people, and now I am negotiating a fraud version of myself that I think they will accept. So I lose touch with myself, they lose touch with me, and at the same time we all lose touch with truth, but we all converge on a false set of propositions that we can rally around as a banner of, it's really just a shared narrative for a societal niche, uh, up which you can climb the hierarchical ladder. It's... And, and none of those, none of that has any meaning to it. And yeah. now you're also fake. Yeah. <laughs> One of the most powerful yeah. things you said there was the, the, the disintegration of the identity. And yes. So what that really means is that I'm going to like, you know, inject all of the, all of the value that I can extract out of a particular situation in a, in a particular niche into my propositional knowledge space and it, so that it propagates. And then what that ends up doing, if, it, if it's false constantly because it loses fidelity down the stack, is yep, yep. it's at the expense of your identity, which your identity would be nested in your participatory knowledge space, yes, it, yes. which is the most, most self-evident um, solid knowledge space that you have to even start your agentic existence. And so yes, that's exactly that right. is a super, super dangerous thing. You know, um, <laughs> that's why you would, man. It, so it costs you agency. It costs you agency in the arena of genuine base reality in exchange for having agency in a proxy reality. Right. And then what can start to happen is, you know, bringing this into some sort of like a biblical context, kind of, is that whatever the spirit, spiritual things are of the ideas that, and, and stuff like that, those are the things that become the puppet masters of this, of, of all of these people. And that you, yeah. you run into ideological possession because now you're saying things that are aimed at the virtue signaling. And then you start saying things procedurally then in repetition and that you know will have this positive feedback loop. 
and then you can only see the reciprocal narrowing starts to come in. So now your perspective is only drawn down into this one perspective. And now where, where is the agent in, in all of that? It's the puppet master that's of the, of the idea. And so you, so the new arena, cause there's an agency arena relationship. The new arena is now the marionette stage. And so, and so you, and that's the only that, arena with which you have agency and it's not even your agency. Exactly. So Jung comes in and says, people don't have ideas. Ideas have people. Yes. So, yes. It's a very good statement. A yeah. Very good statement. Oof, that's really scary. That scares me a lot. You know? That's, yeah. And it's frightening. It's frightening. Um, I think that's a healthy fear though. Well, I think, I think, uh, I'm running out of juice and I, I just got indication that my wife is home. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I say we should, uh, probably wrap this up and pick it up again in the near future. Um, yeah, I really enjoyed, uh, I really enjoyed having the conversation and it, it really helped me to kind of work through some, some of these things that I have been floating around in my head for a while. <laughs> Yeah, um, I'm. <laughs> and, and to hear like some of this stuff that you were talking about is, yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, I mean, it this this whole project of FSI has been <laughs> just completely life changing for me, and it I'm starting to see how it's starting to affect um, other people, and not just because I am making propositional truth claims about the thing. It's because of what I'm oriented towards. And it kind of dumbfounds me that anybody would find any sort of value in this. But, um, <laughs> you know, but I, I don't know. But I also think to myself, like, I spend a lot of my day listening to conversations between people and i think that this is becoming a more common thing in in our modern society and right right there's so much more to talk about but uh alternative media is a very powerful thing in a good way yeah yeah exactly it's, it's like it's kind of like the uh printing press where anybody could print a book yes yes, yes. so a jordan um, peterson's so yeah, I'm just, analogy I'm, I'm really just happy to be a part of this and it's like i i look more forward to this than <laughs> I, I could possibly express it's so valuable to me so i really really appreciate everything you've uh you've cultivated and allowed me to and everybody and a lot of other people to participate in because it's yeah I, yeah I, I feel the same way because i couldn't do this without people to do it with and <laughs> so it's it takes it out of the it takes it out of theory and we're actually getting to practice it, at least in a nascent form. Yeah. And that's that's where the beauty of it is. <laughs> that's where the joy is. Well, I guess we'll wrap it up right there. Um, and uh, if you're watching the video, thanks for watching. May the Lord bless you and good day. <laughs>